Okay, so this is a presentation of the various types of anemias. All anemias are is a diminished red blood cell count, so a decreased H&H. So with all the anemias, the patient's going to manifest tachycardia as compensatory, pallor, definitely fatigue. So that's across the board. So let's look at the various types. Iron deficiency anemia, very common. People don't eat an adequate diet, rich in iron. Blood loss, you know, if there's hemorrhage that occurs, they could be iron deficient. And so, you know, blood transfusions are warranted. What do you do about it? You could do um, iron supplementation, PO iron pills. It's a slow way to go about fixing it, but it can be done. Um, IV iron preparations um, that have an improved diet, you know, nurses need to be very familiar with nutrition. So citrus with iron rich foods, like a spinach salad with citrus is gonna help you absorb the iron. So that's an important teaching point. And also, of course, you know, infusion of packed red blood cells. The next type of anemia is called sickle cell anemia. Sickle cell anemia is uh, inherited, so it's got a familial trait to it. It's very high incidence in African American, in the African American population. And what it is, is instead of that red blood cell being all, you know, brown and fluffy like a pillow, in states where there's lower oxygen, oxygen tension, they sickle. So it's an abnormal hemoglobin that occurs. So instead of being able to float nicely through the intravascular space, a sickling cell is going to cause it to kind of bump into the other cells and just kind of get lodged there. And of course that causes even more diminished oxygenation. And so it's kind of a vicious cycle of sickling and then having, you know, clumping together and then more deoxygenation and more sickling. So the patients are in a lot of pain. So anytime you don't have adequate or sufficient blood flow and oxygenation, it's painful. Organ damage could occur, certainly renal failure, the kidney's really sensitive, the renal tubules are tiny. Spleen is high risk to be damaged. So good patient education is important. Um, to ascertain kind of from the patient what, what st stressors are in their life and try to diminish those stressors. Stay away from high altitudes and, you know, be careful about exercise because you don't want to stress the system. Lots of hydration. Um, when they come into the acute care facility, they're in a lot of pain. They come in with an exacerbation or a sickle cell crisis. And so opioids are generally used because the pain is so severe. So these patients may very well have a very high tolerance to opioids, not that they're addicts or addicted. They may very well be, but it doesn't mean that they are just because their tolerance is higher if they're taking PO uh, forms of opioids at home. Okay, another type of anemia is called pernicious or B12 anemia. So B12 is one of the B vitamins and B12 is necessary to move folate into the red blood cell where DNA synthesis occurs and that's how the red blood cell is formed, so red blood cell production. So without sufficient amounts of B12, you're gonna have anemia. So why does this occur where you're B12 uh, deficient? Well, you can have a genetic predisposition for it, or you can bring it on yourself. Heavy alcohol abuse, um, problems with the stomach lining, gastritis, or if the patient had a gastrectomy or that surgery that removes part of your stomach to make the stomach smaller, like a gastric sleeve surgery, or not a sleeve, but if you actually remove the tissue, what you're removing is the part of the stomach that has these parietal cells. The parietal cells are what secretes this intrinsic factor. So it comes down to a B12 deficient patient or a patient with pernicious anemia has a lack of this intrinsic factor in order to absorb the B12. They may appear with kind of idiosyncratic signs, things like a beefy red tongue is a sign of B12 deficiency. Paresthesias of the extremities is also idiosyncratic for B12 deficiency. These patients may also uh, suffer eventually over time with right cardiac failure. So when there's right cardiac failure, you're going to have a subsequent you know, organ failure because it backs up into the surrounding organs and the liver may fail. So something that's also unique about this 
type of anemia is that the patient may manifest jaundice because of the subsequent hemato hepatomegaly that may occur with the right heart failure. So that is down the line. And what do we do about it? Well, I am B12, certainly if the stomach is not able to absorb B12, then there's no point in giving PO B12. Although there are preparations, you know, very high doses of B12 that have been known to replete, replace that B12 over time, even in the PO form. But mostly you should know that it's IM B12 that you need. Aplastic anemia. So anything that's A means it's diminished or none of. So aplastic anemia means there's a diminished amount of red blood cells. And aplastic anemia also implies that it's because of the bone marrow. So it's the failure of the bone marrow to produce these red blood cells. So if you were able to view the hematologic portion, all the form components of the blood are from an immature stem cell from the bone marrow. So when your bone marrow is not producing as it's supposed to, it may very well you know, affect all the levels of the blood components. So this is also associated with thrombocytopenia or diminished platelets or leukopenia or low white blood cells along with the diminished red blood cells. So that is pancytopenia. So in addition to the fatigue and the tachycardia, you also have to worry about bleeding you know, and problems associated with low platelet count. Polycythemia vera is kind of the opposite of aplastic anemia because polycythemia vera is overproduction of those red blood cells because of an overproduction from the bone marrow. So just like with aplastic anemia diminishing all the components that come from the bone marrow, in polycythemia, so poly means very, uh, all of the components are elevated. So too many red blood cells, too many platelets. So this makes the patient in a hypercoagulable state. So they have much higher risk to form clots. So clot formation is an issue, and so it's a higher blood pressure. So that's what the treatment is, is to ensure that you know, they're on some form of anticoagulants, they stay very well hydrated because their blood is more viscous, a little more tenacious. Phlebotomy is also a treatment you know, on a case-by-case -case basis where portions of the blood volume are removed so they don't have as much blood and red blood cells.